Where is he going? Isn't he from Nazareth? Anything good come from Nazareth? Do you think Jerusalem is safe? Does he know that Pilate is there? Where is he going? Does he see the Pharisees watching? Is this the one we've been waiting for? Could this be the Messiah? Where is he going? The crowds are singing Hosanna. Should I lay down my cloak? Is this the beginning of the end? Should we follow? Should we watch? Should we sing Hosanna? Stay awake. He's on the move. Where is he going? Listen. Where is he going? Watch. Where, Where is, is he, he going? going? Stay close. Where is he going? Hosanna. Hosanna. Amen. Amen. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. And as we pray, I invite you to raise your palms above you as we bless them before we process. We praise you, O God, for redeeming the world through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, he entered the holy city in triumph and was proclaimed Messiah and King by those who spread garments and branches along his way. Bless these branches and those who carry them. Grant us grace to follow our Lord in the way of the cross, so that joined to his death and resurrection, we enter into life with you through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We follow the cross as we sing our processional hymn.
Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, sometimes it's hard to hear you over the hosannas. Sometimes it's hard to hear you over the noise of city streets. Sometimes it's hard to hear you over our racing thoughts, our mental to-do lists, or our desire to fit in. Sometimes it is hard to hear you in this noisy world. So just as you stopped traffic in Jerusalem, stop traffic here. Pause the rush. Open the gates. Dwell among us until your word is all we can hear. We are listening. We are laying down our cloaks. Amen. Please be seated. I hope you don't mind, but there are times when I can really be a nerd about the Bible. I, I tend to geek out over the little nuances in the biblical text and try to, to find obscure details in the, the passage Details that no one really talks about or maybe no one has ever even noticed before. And so I found myself doing that a lot in my sermons recently, and I apologize if this bothers you. I'm hoping this is something you like, because there's two reasons why I feel my preaching kind of takes this direction. Number one, I've been preaching on these passages for over 25 years. And after 25 years, I don't want to just keep on repeating the same message over and over again. And I, and I don't want to just focus on what is obvious. But there's also another reason why I think I do this. is because the Word of God is so complex. There, there are just underlying meanings in everything. A, a few weeks ago, I talked about how the miracles of Jesus, it's more about the symbolism than it was the acts themselves. So in that sense... We need to pay attention to the little details in the Bible. It is a, a, a unique piece of literature that comes to us that was written over thousands of years, and, and, it, and it speaks to us new every single time we read the story, every time we hear it read to us. So focusing on the details can be very, very important. And I noticed a couple details right off the bat with this Palm Sunday processional gospel. What is missing in this gospel? Did you notice anything when we read it? Or if you want to take a glance at it right now, is there anything missing in this Palm Sunday gospel? Linnea, the opening song? Didn't we just sing an opening song and kind of march around the church? Yeah, but, but I, any guess is a good guess. What is missing from the Palm Sunday gospel? Palms, yes. Did anyone else notice that? There's no palms. It says there's cutting of branches, but it doesn't say anything about palms. It's more of a focus on people laying their cloaks down before Jesus and his disciples to come into Jerusalem. So that is, I find, fascinating. I, I, I think, in my mind, Matthew just wanted to kind of show the self-sacrifice here by the people, that they're willing to lay down their cloaks, their garments. I mean, would you, if you had a really nice coat, would you want to lay it down and let some donkey ru run over it? and then pick it up later and say, oh, great, I'm glad everyone stepped on this. Prob probably not. So I'm, I'm guessing maybe that's what Matthew wa wanted to, to kind of get across to us. But there's also something else that I think is really instrumental in this story. What is your image of Jesus when he comes into Jerusalem? What is he riding? A donkey. Did you notice that he's not riding a donkey in this passage? Now everyone's looking, what? What are you talking about? I know I'm ruining your image of Palm Sunday. I really apologize for that. He's not riding a donkey. He's riding two donkeys, according to Matthew. Yeah, a donkey and a baby donkey. A colt, a foal of a donkey, right? And so it, Jesus, it, they didn't just go get them and bring them, and most people would say, oh, well, the other one is, the other donkey is just for them to put their coats on or whatever. No, it says that he sat on them. 
So I don't know if this is like the circus, you know, Jesus is coming with one foot on each animal, <laughs> saying, here I am. <laughs> but, but, but I think it brings to mind that we, we're really not meant to take everything in the Bible literally. Um, this is more about prophecy than about what actually happened. And, and I almost get the feeling that Matthew is saying, yeah, just, just write it down. Just, I'm, I'm just going to write it down. It doesn't matter if it really didn't happen. I, we just need to make sure that there's two donkeys in there, because according to the prophet Zechariah, there were two donkeys, and we need, need to have that in the story. It's, it's kind of like when Jesus was crucified, which, of course, as we're moving into Holy Week, we're focusing on, on, on the, the passion of our Lord. Do you remember where the, the, the soldiers put a spear in his side after he died? Do you ever wonder why they did that? Because according to prophecy, his side was supposed to be pierced, and just hanging on the cross wasn't going to get it done. So I mean, I'm not saying it didn't happen that way, but it does make me question, okay, are they just saying this? so that they can see that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. I don't need every single detail to be exactly like the prophecy said, but in that time and in that day with those people, maybe they needed it. No, clearly, when we look at the differences and the nuances in all of these gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all, they all tell different stories, right? They all have their different witnesses that saw different things. And maybe Matthew didn't think the, the palm branches were important. Maybe he just wanted to make sure the prophecy was, was front and center here in this story. But I think it's very clear with Matthew that he saw Jesus as the new Moses, the new lawgiver, and he wanted to make this a very kingly entrance into Jerusalem. And so that's what happens. It's really that way. It's about this monarchy that is coming. But it is not a kingdom like everyone was expecting, it was more like a kingdom, for we are all kin, we're all God's children. And Matthew really wanted to see that happen. Another thing when we look at the Palm Sunday story is we, we see Jesus being so humble riding a donkey, or in this case, two donkeys. Because you think of a donkey being, well, it's not the most impressive animal in the world, we use the name of a donkey, the traditional name for a donkey as sort of a derogatory term to call someone. So to think that Jesus was on a donkey and not on some war horse, we're thinking that this is an act of humility as he's walking, as he's coming into the city of Jerusalem. But it really wasn't that unusual for someone to come into a city riding a donkey. Many people rode donkeys. They were, they were sturdy animals and they could bear a lot of weight. And they were more comfortable to ride in many cases than, than a horse. But the real thing here is that dignitaries and kings, whenever they came into a city, they would come riding a donkey. So Matthew makes sure, and, and the other gospel writers as well, is that when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, everyone could tell that this is someone important. This is a king that is coming into town. Now, the kind of kingdom that they were expecting was different than what Jesus would bring them, but it was still someone very important coming into the town, riding on a donkey. And, and they're singing Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? When we wave our palm branches, I almost get the feeling that we're, we're thinking this is an alternative for Alleluia, right? We can't say Alleluia during the season of Lent except for the one, uh, one exception on Palm Sunday when we can shout Hosanna. It's this celebratory thing where we're waving palm branches and everyone is filled with joy. And our image of what happened in Jerusalem on that day was, was we look at it as a happy time, a, a time of celebration. But Hosanna really means God save us. Save us. It's like the, the, the people were pleading with Jesus. They're living in an occupied land. So these are the Jewish people that had come, and, and they're, they're under Roman rule, Roman control. They weren't able to live their life. They didn't have the freedoms that they needed. And in many cases, they weren't even able to worship they want, the way they wanted to worship. And so Jesus comes into this, this moment, and people are saying, God, save us. It's almost like they're, they're, they're not celebrating. I mean, there is a, an element of joy that, okay, the one who can save us is finally here, but they're also wondering what that is going to look like. You see, we cannot celebrate Palm Sunday without knowledge of what comes next, because we're looking at it on the other side of the crucifixion. We know that 
the same crowd that was yelling Hosanna in just a few days is going to be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And while we know that we human beings are fickle and we need to change our minds all the time, in this element, in this turmoil that is happening, and literally the entire town was shaken by Jesus' arrival. It wasn't just a little parade that was going down the street. They were shaken because they were wondering what is going to happen next. While they thought that Jesus was going to overthrow the throne of Rome, they also had to know that some people were going to die, that it was going to be a violent revolution. And they were trying to figure out if they were going to survive all of this. Much of the way, this tension that we're caught in on Palm Sunday every single year, yes, we want to celebrate in the joy and the hope, but we also know what comes next. And sometimes that is emotional, and sometimes that is very difficult for us to fear and for us to feel within ourselves. So on Palm Sunday, as Jesus is coming into town, riding two donkeys, whether he's standing on it or sitting on it or reclining back on both of them, or maybe he just has a foot on, one, on the little donkey, as he's coming into town, this king is coming into a place with all kinds of expectations about what is going to happen. And most of the time, we think that this is a parade-type setting. I mean, we even act like it is a parade every single Palm Sunday when we march around the sanctuary or, or, or we march around the church. But the thing we have to know is that this was a protest. This wasn't a parade. The Palm Sunday procession, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Jesus, that looked a lot more like a Black Lives Matter movement than a Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade. And whether you agree with the Black Lives Matter movement or not, these were people that were oppressed and they thought that their answer, their salvation had finally come. And, and that calls to mind what is happening in our world right now. Last week, there was another school shooting in Nashville, as I'm sure most of you know. And to say that that hit close to home is an understatement. Out of the six victims, one of those victims was the nine-year-old daughter of the senior pastor. And I don't know how much longer we can exist like this, and how much longer and how many more lives are going to be lost until something is done. Like those crowds that were there on Palm Sunday, they thought that it was a change of leadership that just needed to happen. If Jesus just made himself king, everything is going to be better. But that's not what happened. You see, Jesus came into Jerusalem to let everyone know that he's coming into their lives. He's coming into our lives. He's going to enter our hearts. That's where the change is going to happen. When, when we talk about the things that need to be changed in this world, we can say, oh, we just need a new president. We need a new governor. We need this and that. But really, we're the ones that need to take to the streets and shout Hosanna. We, if you want change to happen in the world, you need to be the change. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing right now, is coming to each one of us and urging us and gently nudging us in the way of peace, in the way of love, in the way of forgiveness. Amen. <laughs>
Please join in the reading of the Affirmation of Faith. We believe in a God who walks headfirst into the world's suffering, who lights a candle in the darkest night, who pulls back the curtain so we can see the stars. We believe in a God who does not shy away from the truth, who is bold in seeking justice and humble in taking power. We believe in a God who sees our hurt and wraps love around it, cocooning us in hope, tethering us to one another. We believe in a God who is always carrying us from the pain of the world into the hope of a new day. That is where God is headed. That is where we follow. May it be so. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Save your church, O God. Enable us to boldly confess in every time and place that Jesus Christ is Lord. With the humility of a servant, equip congregations, synods, and other ministry settings to proclaim your extravagant love for all. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Save your creation, O God. Every living being you have made has purpose. Give us renewed appreciation of farm animals who labor in the fields, service animals who accompany their human companions, and beloved pets who live alongside us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Save the peoples of the earth, O God. Restore dignity to those who are scorned and persecuted for their religious beliefs or political activism and deliver them from the hand of their enemies. Bring peace to places where conflict runs deep. Merciful God, save those who cry to you in any need, O God. Watch over all who are incarcerated or awaiting trial and stand with those who are unjustly accused. Be present with those feeling isolated, lonely, or fearful. Calm all those who are facing illness, surgery, or new diagnoses, especially Beth, Paul, Barb, Lois, Edna, Martin, Carolyn, Grace, Paul, Kevin, Lori, Mark, Lavelle, Brian, Jill, and all others that we remember silently or aloud. Merciful God, Save us in your love, O God. Guide the work of church musicians, pastors, choirs, readers, deacons, technicians, acolytes, and all who assist in worship. Sustain them in their leadership as they accompany congregations throughout this holy week. Merciful God, save us at the last, O God. We give you thanks for your saints of old who embodied your servant love. As you came to their aid, so deliver us in times of trial, that every knee would bend in praise to you. We give you thanks for our recently departed and continue to ask for strength for the families of Kenneth Bergman, Dorothy Bryson, and Audrey Gorsuch. Merciful God, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share that peace with one another.
Let us pray. God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. For you sent your child to be our teacher and our guide. Through him, you showed us how to love and be loved how to enact justice and pray for peace, how to seek truth and share in joy. And so with the choirs of angels, the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of the lost and the found. Surely it is right for us to give our thanks and praise. For day after day we look for you. And day after day we find you. In the laughter of children. In the sun rising over the horizon. In the flowers of spring. Our seeking does not go unanswered, and for that, we are grateful. So first and foremost, we come to you in prayer to say thank you. For when we are seeking beauty, you give us mountains and freckles, green eyes and brown eyes. When we're looking for reason to hope, you give us rainbows after the storm and candles flickering in the window. When we are seeking peace, you give us three-part harmony and the sound of rain. And when we're seeking justice, your life reminds us that everyone is welcome at your table and none shall be turned away. In that seeking, we remember. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For all these reminders, we are deeply grateful. And yet, gracious God, our seeking does not stop. For even though your fingerprints are all over this world, we are not yet at your promised day. So in addition to our gratitude, we also pray for conviction. Do not let us get comfortable with half-hearted seeking. Do not let us grow numb to the suffering of this world. Make us relentless in our pursuit of justice, relentless in our consoling of the grieving, in our welcoming of the stranger and in in the feeding of the hungry. Like a dog with a scent, may we walk toward your kingdom never giving up, never wandering off the path. And as we see and as we seek, pour out your spirit on this ordinary bread and cup. May this meal be the nourishment we need to continue seeking you in the world. Until your promised day, we will pray. Until your promised day, we will seek. Through Christ, our guide and companion. Amen. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray in the words most comfortable to each. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
As a reminder, when we, as we are communing today, we'll commune one side first, starting with the pulpit side. You'll come forward and receive the host. If you need a gluten-free host, just let me know. I can provide that. There's wine and grape juice after that. Dispose of your cup at the side and then return to your seat. Friends, if your seeking has led you here, if your weary heart followed breadcrumbs all the way to this sanctuary, then I have good news. You do not need to seek anymore. This table is God's table. So if you came here looking for justice, then rest in the comfort that all will be fed here. If you came seeking beauty, then let your spirit marvel at the beauty of a community coming together. If you came seeking a brush with the divine, then know that God is present in this ordinary meal. So kick off your walking shoes. Let your weary heart stop the search. We are standing on holy ground. This is God's table. All are invited. Thanks be to God.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Embodied God, at your table we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. I invite the assembly to be seated for the reading of the Passion. Please note the assembly is invited to read aloud the bolded pieces of the text. After Jesus was arrested by the Judean police, Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So, you're a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Judeans again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Judeans answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Judeans cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover and was about noon. He said to Judeans, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed them over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with the two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. 
Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Judeans said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew all was finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Seek out the hungry, seek the weary, seek the good in every person you pass, seek out the hopeful, seek the faithful, seek God in each of us. As you seek and as you wander, may you find what you are looking for. In the name of our loving God, who is always seeking us. Amen.
Connected to community, neighbor, and faith, go in peace. Seek and serve in love. Thanks be to God.